And a warm welcome to you for this fifth day of our second week of the General Conference. And we begin with our first talk. Our first speaker for today is Cardinal Jean-Claude Hollerich, Archbishop of Luxembourg and Relator General of the 16 Ordinary General Assembly of the Synod of Bishops. Cardinal Hollerich, though he is Archbishop of Luxembourg now, he has lived in Asia for 23 and a half years. He is a member of the Society of Jesus. He came as a young Jesuit scholastic in Japan, and then he exercised his ministry at the Sophia University in Japan. He was 23 and a half years in Japan, and therefore he had journeyed in a way with the church in Asia. He will now, he has been appointed Relator General by the Holy Father of the 16 General Assembly of the Synod of Bishops, and therefore he has accompanied the synodal process very closely. He will share with us now his reflections and insights on the synod and synodality. He will address us for 20 minutes. Welcome. Cardinal Jean-Claude. So thank you very much. Uh, dear brother cardinals and bishops, dear colleagues in priesthood, and dear sisters and brothers in baptism. Um, a synod about synodality. Surely it went through your head that is a very difficult title, and it's very difficult to speak about. So when I get asked, what is all this synod about? I normally answer, it is a synod about the church. We are 60 years after Vatican II. And Vatican II defined the collegiality of the bishops. This was first uh, pursuing uh, the program of the First Vatican Council, which had to disband because of political reasons. But of course, in the mid of the 20th century, that could addressed in a different way. And Pope Paul VI established the Synod of the Bishops based on this collegiality. But Vatican II and it's teaching about the church. It's more than the collegiality of bishops. In Lumen Gentium, we speak about the church as people of God, priesthood based on baptism, holy temple of the spirit. And Pope Francis takes these elements up and integrates them into synodality. Uh, so, now synodality is bigger than just collegiality of the bishops. We see a new development. Uh, it started with the synod of the families, where there was a large consultation before. It was already mentioned in this assembly. And before the youth synod, there was even a pre-synodal meeting of young people. And a lot of what these young peoples have said and decided went into the instrumentum laboris for the Synod. And uh, when we look to the Synod about the Amazon region, uh, there was Repam before, a whole network of uh, people on the basis who prepared this Synod. And now it's even more. Because the Synod was opened by the Pope in October 21. So we are already in the Synod. And we do not speak about the pre-Synodal consultation, in fact. But the consultation of the people of God is part of the Synod. Uh, of course, this consultation was not perfect. It was not perfect because some people 
did not like the idea. Some people did not understand it. And then we still had the COVID crisis, where in some countries it was very difficult uh, to gather people. But nevertheless, it was a tremendous and unprecedented success. 112 bishops' conferences sent their synthesis in. That is uh, of a total of 114. And believe me, those who did not answer, I'll give you one example and you understand, was the Latin bishops, uh, Roman bishops of Ukraine. So that it's not a total of 114 also has very good reasons. Even 18 dicasteries of the Roman Curia answered and participated. 13 Oriental churches, consecrated life, women and men answered. So there was really a large participation all over the world. And uh, we got a lot of synthesis. It was a pleasure to read them, but of course one single person cannot read all the synthesis and uh, understand everything. So we had a meeting in Frascati where 25 experts, good Christians, gathered from all continents. And I'm very happy that we have here some people who participated in this process. So if you could just stand up, that people might see you and acknowledge you. And they did a tremendous work. Everybody of them had gotten some homework to read some synthesis and to pick up what was most important in this synthesis. But it was divided in such a way that every synthesis was read by several people so that you have a, a good equilibrium. And uh, then praying together, reflecting together, putting things together. And uh, we had two writers because we think that it's not enough to publish such a document just in Italian. So we said all the Senate documents will be published in Italian and in English at the same time. So we had two writers, one Italian, one English. And uh, um, we also had given already the first draft to the Holy Father who approved it. And then all the next drafts got handed over to the Pope. We're also very happy to have uh, had the Council of the Senate, I mean cardinals and bishops, and very eminent people from Asia uh, were there. And they also unanimously approved the document. And this document still had to be reworked because we have gotten certain modi, so modification proposals, which of course we have to consider. And we also wanted to give examples of what the people of God has said. And many good examples were picked up. But then when the document was ready, you can say we noticed, oh, we have too many quotations from that continent, <laughs> not quotations enough from that other continent. And so, again, a rereading, a looking for picking up the good quotations, because it's very strange. There were many, many similar points uh, in all of the synthesis we got, and so we could find quotations a little bit equally reparted from all the continents. I first had hoped that I could present you this document today. But 
as all of this correction work of the document goes on, it will only be published, probably, most probably, on the 27th of this month at 12.15 Roman time. So I cannot speak about the document, <laughs> but I can speak about my experience. First, my personal experience is that I have to be a good listener. Because as a relator, my function is not to put all my thoughts in the document. That would be a misuse of the charge I have got. But to listen what the people of God is saying, trying to understand that in my experience, and help to put it into words. But of course, such a document cannot be written by one single person. You need a team. And uh, it is beautiful to work in such a team in a synodal way. But my experience also as Archbishop of Luxembourg, uh, I had to listen to my church. And uh, some of you might have had the same experience. Some people use the synod for telling things what they always wanted to tell. Mm -hmm. Not so much in a synodal way, but uh, sometimes in what the Pope would call indietrismo, going back to past times. Mm -hmm. um, you have, as a bishop, really to pray and to discern, but also listen to criticism. Nobody of us is perfect. And even if we try to do our mission as bishop with all our heart, sometimes we failed. And I noticed that in my own diocese. And that was very helpful to me. And I could understand also when the Pope speaks about synodal conversion that I'm also meant. Let us now come to the synthesis of the different bishops' conferences and allow me uh, to uh, give some common points. The first is let us walk together. The Pope says it so often, caminamos juntos. There should be no exclusion. When we presented the first draft to the Pope, he was very happy and, and repeated, tutti, 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 all, all, all have to be included. So in this tutti, there are homosexuals. There are divorced and remarried people. African churches spoke about polygamy. People without education, the poor. They are, in fact, the margins of the church. And we cannot walk without opening our hands to these sisters and brothers. This does, of course, does not mean that we approve polygamy. No? So it is going together away, accompanying people and giving a place in the church to everybody. And perhaps that can lead us to a more evangelical attitude towards people. I think we can get inspired by Christ. And people wrote that. Now people get inspired by the gospel. And they sometimes feel to see these deep attitudes of compassion and of love of Jesus in our church. If we take the image of a tent for the church, the tent has to be enlarged. We have to make our tent larger to accommodate all the people. And of course, there are tensions. There are people who ask for uh, blessings of homosexual couples. Other people ask for Latin mass. So the tensions are very wide. 
But we can now, because sometimes it's difficult to have tensions, and I know as a bishop sometimes we have a lot of tensions to, to carry in our churches. So I would like to pray that we can, with patience and humility, carry these tensions, and these tensions will help us to be in a process, and this process will bear fruit. I think that's the thinking of Pope Francis. I needed a long time to understand it, because sometimes it, why does the Pope react? You know? He bears the tensions and looks for the fruit coming out of them. And of course, we should be in communion with all of these tensions and the differences. And our communion is based on the Eucharist. That's also in Lumen Gentium. But we are also the people of God walking through time and led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has a very important role in this new ecclesiology. And perhaps a little bit correction, you know our Orthodox brothers and sisters always said that we were too much Christ-centered and not enough Spirit-centered. I think the Synod will allow us to have this new uh, balance. And when we walk through time, and Christ is our center. It is only normal that some people walk a little bit quicker. Some people are a little bit slower. So they walk before Christ, they walk behind Christ. It's also clear that there are some people at the right and some people at the left of Christ. The important thing is that Christ should remain our center. Because if Christ is not a center and we look to the others, we see them as enemies. If Christ is our center, we see Christ and then the people at the other side. So we can see them through Christ. And that helps us to walk together. Now a very important word is participation. And participation goes to core responsibility. And in many, many syntheses, here people first speak of parish level. Yes. That they feel frustrated because their priest doesn't ask their opinion, their priest doesn't invite them, or they all discuss something and then the priest does something completely different. So the word clericalism appeared quite often. So how can we come to a bigger core responsibility where the priesthood of all the baptized and the ministry we have can go together and where the ministerial priesthood can really become again a ministry, a service where we do not speak about the power of the hierarchy, but of the authority of the hierarchy, which is rooted in service. And of course, when we speak about core responsibility, we have to speak about women. So nearly all the synthesis mentioned women. It is not something we can ignore. Of course, Based on the different cultures, people speak differently from women. In Western Europe and in some other countries, uh, people asked for uh, the deaconate for women or for priesthood for women. In other countries, no, not at all. But all the countries had the same. Women are not just the servants of the priests, but women have a responsibility in the church. And uh, we should try to show that in our appointments and so on, that women are co-responsible. That we just, we also said, we said before, that Christ became man, flesh, sacsa genitor. 
and a human. Uh, of course, Christ was a man, not a woman. But why didn't St. John said Christ became male, but always became human? So the baptism of men is not more valid than the baptism of women. And that must have consequences in our way of working together and sharing this core responsibility. And of course, all this church is missioned by Christ. So if we speak about structures without speaking about mission, we have a problem. And this mission first is to proclaim Christ's death and resurrection for us. But that can be proclaimed in many different ways. No? Of course, the bishops and the priests, they have to announce the gospel. It must be done by words. The Pope very often says, uh, announce the gospel when it's necessary even by words. No? Which means that the announcement of the gospel by our life, by our lifestyle, is much more important. And in this mission of the church, I mean, the Pope pointed out in his encyclical letters, uh, what is proclamation of Christ also in the world of today? Again, Laudato Si, integral ecology, where not climate is the center, but man is the center. And that we have to change our lifestyle in some way in order that people can understand that it is serious. And uh, that this is the ecological conversion. It's always a conversion to Christ first. And we cannot be missionary disciples of Christ without living that conversion. And then Fratelli Tutti this universal brotherhood that in a globalized world uh, the next to me is not just my neighbor in my country but that person closest to me are those on the margins who get abandoned by society and that worldwide. So these are great challenges and I am sure that a church which becomes more synodal uh, will be also more missionary. Because now, at least in my country, many people think that's the job of the priests. Huh? They should do it. No. It's the mission of the church. But unless you make people also co-responsible, they will not take up this universal mission of the church. They will remain mute sheep. And we do not want to be mute sheep because every Christian is a sheep and a shepherd. So I think that this synod is a great chance for the church. Uh, but we do not do the synod on synodality because it is a chance. We do not do it because in the postmodern world we have to do it like that, even if these reasons are perfectly valid. We do it because the church in its essence is a synodal church, even if we haven't lived it so clearly during the past centuries. It belongs to the depositum fidei uh, of the church. Now I think I have just spoken one minute too long, so I stop here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cardinal Jean-Claude, for your reflections, for having shared the fruit of your experience with this synodal journey. We would be grateful if you remain for some time so that we can have some plenary uh, conversation. Uh, may I request the house, anyone among you who would like to uh, ask some question, offer some comment or clarification, 
you're welcome to do so. Yes, I can see one hand, Bishop Sebastian. Yes. The second one is there. Yeah. Cardinal, thank you for your presentation. Whenever we speak about uh, synodality, always we question clericalism. Mm. Clericalism is a very big problem. Mm. But my question to solve the cler clericalism is to make the laity clerical. Mm. <laughs> because the demand is all, all, they accept all the clerics, others wish to become cleric. Shall we take one more question? Your Eminence will take one more. I can see the hand there. Thank you very much, Your Eminence. Um, the, the, the Synod on Synodality is really um, a leap of faith and grace. Since we are a conference of bishops, and one of the manifestations, immediate manifestations of synodality is the collegiality of bishops considered as successors of the apostles. Are you at liberty to speak something about the emerging reflections on the communion, participation, and mission among us bishops? I believe if there will be a change in the church, it would first begin with the brotherhood of bishops while the initiative is not exclusively theirs. I would be interested to know what are the emerging reflections regarding the collegiality among bishops and conferences. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first, the question about uh, clericalism and lay people. So, I think we have to speak about clericalism, but in a very prudent way, in order not to hurt priests, because as we have already said, many priests uh, have a lot of pressure on them, and they do not need pressure now of their bishop. But we have to offer them help and to see that they can have a more healthy priest life when they act synodality. Uh, I can give you an example. When we were in Frascati, uh, I did not tell people what to do. Well, they are very perfect to, to know that them by themselves. No? But I felt very happy to be with them, accompany them, if necessary. No? And I think this kind of conversion, where you can be a very happy priest without deciding everything <coughs> just by yourself, is something we have to make priests experience. There always is the danger of a wrong clericalization of laity. So to build up a second clergy. And then you have wars, one clergy fighting the other one. That, of course, is not meant. Uh, I had to give an example which is a little bit similar. I have in my diocese many permanent deacons who are married. And uh, we pay very much attention, information, that they should not have the dream of being priests of a second category, becoming more clerical than the priests. No? But that every deacon must have a work as a deacon, social work. Of course, he's also there at Mass. No? But uh, we have a problem in Europe that many priests think that their only work is celebrating Mass. You know? I was with some priests in holiday, and then it's very nice to listen to their conversations. Now, so all their conversations were, how do we organize Masses in our territory? Because, you know, we have a great leg of priests, so we have now very huge parishes. And they do not think, how should I proclaim the gospel? But how should I uh, organize masses in which church and, and so on? Huh? And that, of course, is uh, completely wrong. We have to announce the gospel 
and the deacon has an important function as a deacon in the announcement of the gospel. I personally think that's why he reads the gospel during Mass, no? because he has to work for it uh, in daily life. No? And uh, very clerical uh, lay people, it's not a way of synodality. No? But lay people do what they see. So if we behave like that, they will also behave like that. It means we have to change our behavior first. No? So now I've spoken so much that I need a hint for the second question. So that, uh, union among the bishops. Yeah. No, that is a very important role. No? So we had as a sign of collegiality the bishops' conferences uh, after Vatican II. And you see that is a success because you are here, FABC, Federation of Asian Bishops' Conferences. But sometimes it can also be narrow. And I can give the example of Europe. Uh, there is not so much uh, exchange between the bishops' conferences. And then you come to situations where some bishop conference fight another bishop's conference. And that is very unhealthy for the church. No? Because the sign of uh, disruption in communion is the worst sign we can have for proclaiming the gospel. And so we need this collegiality also to have it lived simply by seeing each other having a beer together when possible. No? Of course, the distances are very big. No? Mm -hmm. But take time for one another. We have all become, at least in Europe, the mirror of society. We are much too busy. And if we are too busy, we cannot discern what is right. You need silence for that. You need time for discerning. And that's also why we have the Synod now in two years, 23 and 24. For discerning, you need time. We are not in a hurry. We have not to change the church or uh, change ourselves in one day. It will not happen if we try it. And so lose some time with our brother bishops. I think that's something very important. Because we can also check. No? I can now have certain uh, insights. I think they come directly from God. And then I speak with my colleague who has a complete different vision. And that's healthy. I have to hear that. No? So this bishop's collegiality, I think, it's more than just a collegiality of teaching in the church. Uh, and it would, and uh, you know, that's why I like to go outside of Europe. When I was in Mexico for the uh, assembly, ecclesial assembly of uh, Latin America and the Caraibs, and also here, life is much more simpler than in Europe. There is a pragmatism here that I do not see so much in Europe. And we need that. We need more simplicity, more pragmatism to go on. Um, in this conference, some people spoke about Eurocentrism. I hope it is finished now. Because in Europe, we are very happy to have a pope outside from Europe <laughs> to give some new wind. Otherwise, the church is falling apart in Europe. No? Uh, we are not a model. We look up to you how you do. And then we try to translate that into our cultural uh, uh, realities. So uh, the Church of Europe needs input from other continents. And I feel blessed that I can come here. So thank you yeah. very much for the thank, invitation. Thank you, Cardinal Jean-Claude. We have two more hands. Others who would like to intervene, kindly let me know. Yeah. There are two hands here, Cardinal Patrick, Bishop Joshua, and then one hand behind. We'll take these three together. Cardinal Patrick of Bangladesh. 
Mike, please. Your Eminence, so joyful to hear uh, your talk or your message to us because you are somebody who is within the whole process and we are really edified. Second thing is we have mentioned that mission of the church, first of all, should be our lifestyle. And that touched me very much. Our lifestyle is nothing but please, evangelical. Please, a bit louder, please. Louder. Our lifestyle is not something uh, than evangelical gospel and not only through the words that we should be preaching but also through our witness or testimony so uh, this lifestyle I would like to have little elaboration and you know, what is meant for us and third thing after Second Vatican Council, collegiality came, very much emphasized. But then after a few years, another emphasis came, and that is to say the particular churches are the most important. Every bishop is the head of the particular church. We have a continent, a national and continental uh, gatherings, uh, and which is good. But somehow the collegiality uh, among the bishops within the church, within, uh, when, among the particular churches, has not really developed enough. And it's the first time I also feel this in the continental level, that collegiality has progressed a lot. So this is our hope uh, in the church, and the church will be church as synod. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll take two, one more intervention, uh, Bishop Joshua, and then there was one more hand there, yeah. but His Eminence will respond to these two interventions first. Your Eminence, I'm so happy Though we have discussed the Synod of the Synodality in the regional level, national level, when I came here and listened to you, I understood more clearly because uh, evangelization is the priority of ours. For that, we have to listen, we have to walk together. By our unity, let people know that we are Christians. And the FABC meeting, I experienced that. The unity of uh, 29 countries coming together and we are walking together, we are listening together. That is giving more impetus for evangelization. So, for that evangelization, the incarnation of Christ should be made possible in me, through me. For that, the attitude of Christ, we should emphasize. Thank you. Thank you. Your Eminence, would you like to respond to these two interventions? I mean, uh, I shall respond, but even I think the two interventions have already a value uh, in themselves. Now. Um, you know that I'm a religious, now, so I have my vows of uh, chastity, uh, obedience, and poverty. And I noticed with time that I, when I was young, chastity was the most difficult. When I was in the prime of life, it was obedience, because you want to do things by yourself. You know? And now when I'm old, it's poverty, <laughs> because I like to be tempered a little bit. You know? 
So that is where I have to fight personally, no? but it might be different for each of us, no? to be a little bit more credible. And uh, I also think that we have the idea that collegiality of bishops are just the bishops. But as you said, the particular churches are important. So when bishops meet, it should not just be in our head and in our heart that we meet as bishops, but that our churches meet. We are members of the people of God with a special ministry we have inside this people of God. No? But I hope that when I am somewhere, also the Church of Luxembourg is a little bit there. And therefore have to be listening uh, to this church also. No? Um, and if we can transform our meetings of bishops, that we know that we are not alone, that we are part of the people of God, then, yeah, it will be easier. And uh, I know that I have to change quite a lot. I'm very uh, thankful to the Pope because he speaks very often about conversion. But he's always smiling, and that's good. <laughs> Otherwise, I would be afraid. <laughs> even I'm sometimes afraid, uh, even if he smiles. But uh, I, I see that I have to change gradually. And I also can do that only with the help of my brothers. And there I'm in a very bad position because, uh, as you know, Luxembourg has no bishops' conference. <laughs> I have an auxiliary with whom I can share. But then I'm happy to have Comissé and uh, the bishops of Comissé uh, to, to do that. But conversion is never just something, it's extremely personal, but it's not individual. The community is there. And that is something I think we have to get more to an ecclesiological uh, meaning uh, of conversion. I am part of my church as its pastor. And I think what you said uh, dear Brother Bishop, was perfect in itself. <laughs> yes. There was a hands, uh, there are two hands I can see. Uh, there was Bishop De, and, and then Bishop Malari. Yeah. Good morning. I'm Bishop Emmanuel Rosario from Bangladesh. Thank you very much, Your Eminence, for your wonderful presence, uh, the presentation and clarification of certain things. I have a question regarding uh, this uh, synodal process and it is from the very fact of our uh, experience in the grassroots level. The church in its very essence is synodal and it's, uh, the inclusiveness is one of the essential characteristics of synodal process. While working uh, with our people of God in the rural areas, we see also there are certain social and cultural systems and practices, rules in the society. So while as pastor working with the mentality of inclusiveness, we try to get, uh, find the lost sheep, include it in the society. The, the 99 who are in the, with the pastor get lost. So this is a problem. So in that process of inclusiveness, and uh, the, we find this, some social and cultural barriers. In, in those circumstances, how uh, it, and we, we see it is not that easy to uh, go with that inclusiveness smoothly. So in that process, so can you suggest something on, do, on those challenges, what as pastors can we do? Thank you. I mean, I cannot suggest anything for your situation because you know the situation much better than me. How could I, coming from Luxembourg, give you a suggestion how to do it in your country? No? But I can say that I sometimes feel the same. And in Europe, it's still 
if you take uh, the lost sheep, the parable, we have 99 lost sheep. No. There's just one remaining. <laughs> no. So we have some work to do. No? But I think that the parable of the lost sheep, no shepherd would do that. So it shows the love and the mercy of God in Christ. And if we can show the love of God and mercy in Christ to our assembly, it will change with time. And things, processes need time. So it's not something that will change from today to tomorrow. But Thanks. you know better than me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Prime Minister. Last, Bishop Malari. Please, mic. Please bring the mic. Thank you, uh, Cardinal, for your presence. I was really struck by uh, your talk, specifically when you mentioned the church as uh, one who welcomes everyone, uh, the LGBTQ+, plus, <laughs> the, the divorced uh, couples, and etc. And that uh, the there are tensions in welcoming these different groups and that we have to bear the tensions and with the hope that uh, something will come out from it. Uh, having in mind always uh, the reality of the passion, death, and resurrection. And uh, this is uh, easier said than done. We know that. And, uh, and yet, it's something really that we really have to embrace uh, as a church. In one of my uh, conversation and consultation with the LGBT group through Zoom, there was one parishioner who, who told me that uh, the church is always talking to crowds uh, and they do not talk to individuals, uh, meaning he was saying, can it be that that service of the church be customized, be really <laughs> specific to certain groups and certain individuals? I think this is also something that uh, uh, we have to embrace. It's not easy because we will have more preparations to do in our meeting to individuals, we cannot just say one thing uh, to everybody, but we have to be very specific to, to different groups. Uh, maybe, I, I hope you can also elaborate more on this and uh, from your heart. Thank you, thank you very much. No, thank you. And I think it is exactly as you said. It's easy to speak about it, it's much e more difficult. Uh, to live these tensions now. Because as Father has said, uh, it is also that there is a tension sometimes between the doctrine of the church and the pastoral attitude we have. Now. And, but I really think that tensions with time are fruitful if we take time again. Time and prayer is needed now, to see that. Um, when I was professor at Sophia University in Tokyo, I was always with young people. And all of a sudden, becoming bishop, no young people anymore. Because when you go to our churches in Europe, there are no young people. No? You have to do something special in order to meet them. So I started to, make, to offer trips for young people during summer. And three times, we came with 100 young people to Thailand and to the north. We build a church with the villagers in a small village in the jungle. And twice we were at the Jesuit uh, small university called the Savior Center, close to Xianrai, for mountain people. And 
it was important for me to be two, three weeks together with the young people. At the beginning, they are very astonished when we had mass every day. <laughs> no. And one came to me and said, uh, we could also have mass uh, perhaps uh, every three days. <laughs> that could be very nice. Uh, but we kept mass every day. And at the end, the same young man told me, well, I will miss these masses. And I had then a certain small number also of girls and boys who were homosexual who came up to me to speak about it. And then I felt like a father, you know, or grandfather. It's more realistic. You know. <laughs> uh, if your grandchild comes to you and tells you that, how do you react? You will not change your mind that uh, a normal society is, or marriage in the Catholic Church is man and woman. But you will have all the love for that child also. And you will not expel that child. And when I listened to them, I heard stories, a tentative of suicide, terrible stories. And part of it was also the church, which did not accept them. So I felt that I have to change my behavior towards them. And again, it's a tension. I also do not exactly know how to do it or what to do it and so on. Uh, I have not the answer. But that's good because the answer is something the church will give when the church lived that tension for some time. And uh, my experience is part of the experience that will give an answer with time. But uh, uh, I heard things that I never could have imagined. So now I encourage them to have one partner. <laughs> and that's, you know that I'm a Jesuit, there's always uh, about grace uh, a big... Uh, fight between Jesuits and Dominicans in the past. No? I do not want to come back to that. <laughs> but I think that you can just people to do the best they are able to do. You cannot ask people to do the best possible. Yes, what is possible for that person. But not the best uh, uh, objectively. If they cannot do it, they will despair. So we have to help them walk in their life. And, but there is always attention remaining. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Eminence, for your frank, enriching, and insightful sharing, and for reminding us that as leaders of the church, we must learn to live with tension, integrate them in our life, and discern God's will. May I request you to kindly come forward to accept a token of appreciation from our President, Cardinal Charles. And now may I request all of you to spend a few moments in silent reflection.
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. <laughs> 